Welcome to the latest episode of Sports Bazaar. Am I being presumptuous in saying our last full episode for the year? For the year. Apart from a series of specials you'll be doing over summer. Yeah, I've recorded a few interviews already. Yes. Some I haven't recorded. So, <laughs> some have been last minute cancellations. <laughs> no, but I have Maybe we'll talk to our members about that. We might do that. I don't think we could... Uh, it's not for general consumption. <laughs> But there's been trouble at mill. <laughs> no, but uh, but on the flip side, I've I've got it. We've got a bunch in the can already, so of good interviews coming up. We've got some, some classics, and we've still got plenty of eps. And uh, we're back in the new. And we're back in the new year. Yeah, so yeah. we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere. But we're right just, now, uh, for our last episode, we're in the middle of our two-part Keith Miller classics. Yes. Uh, the first ep uh, was riveting stuff, and it's brought us to the end of the. First, Second World War. Second World War, Brought yeah. us to the end of the Second World War. Uh, it's just over. I love this guy. He's larger than life. It's another film that needs to be made. So <laughs> we're at the end of the war. And what is... Bring us up to speed. Well, it's the end of the Refresher. war. And they... The end of the war in Europe. So Keith Miller's... Uh, you know, he's a fighter pilot. Yeah. Flying mosquitoes. He is still technically serving. Because the war in Japan has Serving not the ladies, if I remember <laughs> yeah. correctly. And there'll be a lot of that. Uh, but he's since the war in Japan's still going on. So yeah. he, he and his squadron so don't there's know. A there's a might. chance. Yeah. Which is, that, that's a lot of things people forget. Like, the average service person didn't know about the atomic bomb. So they're thinking, we might have to go to Japan and fight. Okay. So yeah. they were all a bit, like, on edge. So, but while... That was happening. Eleven immediately as World War Two was wrapping up in England, in Europe, mm. they were organ. They wanted to organise a series of tests in England between Australia and England to yeah. sort of celebrate the war being over. Sure, because right? cricket had been cancelled. We're back, baby. We're back, yeah. kind of thing. There were sensitivities though because the war still was in Japan. So it was decided rather than going on in Japan, rather than having the Australian team play the English team and act like everything had gone back to normal, it was an English yeah. team versus an Australian service 11, they called it. So it was people. It was a combination of the Air Force mm. and the Army cricketers from who were serving. Right. So it wasn't okay. Bradman and things like this. Still acknowledging yeah. the ongoing. And they, were, and they weren't acknowledged as... They were called the victory test and they weren't acknowledged as proper tests for okay. that reason because it was just seen as being... You know, not good. They also, the Australians thought they were going to lose. They thought their team wasn't as good. Wasn't as good. So they thought, let's not do it. Now, the guy who came up with it The was last like, series in England should not have been regarded as a proper test series <laughs> either. For all the whining that went on. Good the, Lord. They were the spirit of the game is the what matters. The spirit of the game. It's all you need to think about. So there was a guy called Sir Pelham Francis Warner, who was known as Plum Warner, very famous in English cricket. He was the guy that came up with the idea. Plum's Plum. not a great nickname for someone involved in cricket. <laughs> he's, Look he's, out, here he is. Old, old Plum, Plum again. All me plums. <laughs> <laughs> he was very keen to do these series of matches. And so he was actually talking to... Prime Minister of Australia, John Curtin. Yeah. So he was over in London at the time. And so was Field Marshal Thomas Blamey, who was one of the top people in the Australian Army. Yeah. And they're both talking to each other. And he's saying, could you let some of your top cricketers that are still fighting in Japan bring them over so they can play yeah. in this? Right? And um, he actually said to uh, he said to Sir Thomas Blaney, a Warner said, um, where a Hassett, who was potential captain of Australia yes. and, and his players. Where are they he, now? And he said, oh, well, they're dotted about the South Pacific. We do have a war on out there too, you know, <laughs> is what he said. Yes. And then Prime Minister John Curtin says, well, you Englishmen will always be able to find enough Australians to defend those 22 yards, meaning the cricket pitch, yep. out there. Lords and its traditions belong to Australia just as much as England. And then so Pop Warner says, well, we could do with a few more of them here to, to be in the victory test. Sure. Could you release them from service? And Curtin turns to Je uh, Field Marshal Blaney and says, we could send some over, Blaney. What's to stop us? And Blaney says, only a few million Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> so finally, they actually agree to release these cricketers yeah. and send them over to play in these tests. So it became quite a big deal because right. this felt like it was getting back to normal. And it's like the surfing scene in Apocalypse Now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get them in there. <laughs> and so suddenly... You know, this was quite hard to do. So consider some of this. You know, we'd had Keith, who'd been, Camilla had been flying mosquitoes and flying over Europe. Just yeah. This is happening like 11 to 13 days. The test is sort of after 
war has finished sure. in Europe. So it's it's not like a year later. Yeah. It's 11 days afterwards. One guy, <laughs> to give you an idea, Keith Carmody, who was selected for the Australian team, he had been shot down early in 945 while attacking four German ships off Holland. He's rescued by a German boat and placed in solitary confinement. And then he's mer- marched... 240 kilometres to a concentration camp near Berlin. Okay. He's then liberated by the Russians who held him through a very grim month of April. Then he has, he escapes and after dodging a whole bunch of German leftover yeah. army and Russians, he manages to get back and they hear that he's free and going to be back in time. He's good to go. So these are the people that are playing, right? <laughs> they are literally just out of... Yeah. Concentration camps, yeah, some of them okay. prisoner of war camps. Um, so this is a you know huge thing. Now the first test at Lords, it kicks off, and you got to remember this is it's sold out. Most of the people there are in uniform, like they give yeah. lots of tickets to the military and the armed forces. Yes, and the people playing, like people like Keith Miller, have served in the war, yeah. and he's not well known at this stage. But the English crowd are appreciating these Australians because sure. they are these amazing, like they've served their country and yeah, the British okay. over there. So there's this great feeling. Um, one of them, Graham Williams, he was a South Australian. He was the opening bowler. And he walked out to bat at Lords in the first test. Just a fortnight earlier, he'd been released from a prisoner of war camp and he had lost 31 kilograms since he was captured by the Germans at the start of the war. He was shot down in Libya. Yep. So he's been four years in prisoner of war camps. And when he walked out, the whole place stands and applauds. Um, and, you know, just it can't be believed that he's made it to even be out there. Um, he bowls eight wicketless overs, um, but does pretty well. Yep. This was a, a huge task. He had to drink gallons of this thick glucose drink to be able to do it, to yep. stop him collapsing. That's how emaciated he was. And in the heels of his boots were scooped out halves of oranges to stop the, the jarring of when On he was old. Yeah. So Keith Miller says this is the greatest moment he's ever had in cricket, like just this spiritual yep. reaction to what's amazing. happening. And he said Williams just looked bewildered looking at the crowd. It was just absolutely amazing. And um, so they play, Miller plays fairly well, and in the second innings he um, scores 105 runs in 210 minutes, gets a century, and people he's, people suddenly think, wow, who's this Keith he's Miller guy? He's got their attention. He's got their attention. He's going incredibly well. The Times wrote, it's as good a century as been seen at Lords in many a long day. And Australia go on and win this. Um, in the middle of all this, Japan do surrender, so they play five tests. Oh, that's some good news. Yeah, the Japanese give up. Um, and that means Miller's basically, his squadron's disbanded. And he is awarded the 1939-45 star, the France and Germany star, the Defence Medal, the War Medal, and the Australian Services Medal. So he Bravo. is like, you know, his war service is over. Um, and it is, uh, dr- uh, there's one drawn test and the, these tests finish two all. But they're seen as this you know, cathartic, things are getting yeah. back to normal, the war's over. People are in pretty good mood in London mm-hmm. at the time. Yeah. And and Miller just loves it. He's just having a great time. Yeah. And he's suddenly known. Um, he then plays, they do an extra one, which is England versus the Dominions. So New Zealand, South African, <laughs> Australian. <laughs> the Dominions. That's what they called them then. And um, he scores, uh, uh, he, he goes on and scores this amazing... Um, uh, he has amazing. Uh, e- uh, oh, sorry, let me start that again. Um, so he uh, comes out and puts on this amazing performance. Um, he made 185 runs in this game. Yep. But he does it at a speed. He does the century in 115 minutes with anyone who knows Test cricket. Unbelievable. That's right. He is hitting so many balls into it's in the a net. session, basically. Yeah, yeah, in a session. He's he's hitting, and this is a time where people didn't play like this, right? Yeah. Uh, is like you know the current BBL T Twenty, uh, but baseball, if you like, yeah, baseball. But he, he hit so many sixes that the into the members that they retreat into the bar. <laughs> I, I, they wouldn't need a second invite to go I to the bar. Say, I've seen them. the members at Lords. In, in our bonus outrageous. episodes, you have gone. Uh, there is, if you want to hear Mick's take on Lords members, uh, when he was there, uh, sit on your boaters. 
So he's the, this is going incredibly well for him. He, on the way back, he goes through, uh, has to go through India. So he wants to get home after the war. I bet he does. And instead, they he's go. Married, right? Not yet. He's but not he yet. He's met that met Peggy, Peggy in America, but he hasn't gone and married yet. He's he's engaged, but he wants. <laughs> he hasn't been home for like years. Yeah. He's fought the war, and now they make him do this tour of England. And then they say, "Oh, this has been so good. We're going to send this services team through India." And Sri Lanka, which was settled on at the time. Representing his country again. Yeah. When he's in India, there's a huge pro-independence riot in Calcutta while they're playing a game of cricket. And Miller's friend Dennis Compton, who's a bit of a playboy, was the same. He's on 88 Night Out and the protests are all kicking off. And it's a mixed team of English and Australian uh, players. And suddenly Dennis Compton's at the crease and the the whole field is invaded by these protesters. <laughs> and this man goes up to him and says, you play very fine innings uh, for us, Mr. Compton, but you must go. Our friends have been shot by the British police. Get off. And Compton doesn't know what to do because it's like a riot happening. Yeah. And he says, well, uh, Hackett, uh, uh, Hassett, who's the uh, Australian captain, is batting with him. He says, you better speak to Mr. Hassett. He's in charge around here. And he points to Lindsay yes. uh, Hassett. And so the leader of the rioters goes up to Hassett and it comes up all threateningly. And all Lindsay says is, have any of you fellas got a cigarette? <laughs> and they all stop rioting to look for a cigarette to I give do. him. <laughs> and then he, they, the riot ends and he walks off all calm. Like yeah. those. So this is like what he's going through. He gets back to Australia and they say, you have to play um, six more matches in all the states to revitalise cricket in Australia. So he's, all he wants to do is go home. Yeah. And, but he dazzles across all these games and people say he's going to play in the yeah. proper test okay. when it gets started, um, which he does. He goes to New Zealand. He makes his test debut in New Zealand in 1946 um, and plays relatively well. He also gets back into football, which hasn't played since right. before the war. He goes back and plays in the VFL for St Kilda. They finished second last, um, but he does get to play for Victoria, represent Victoria. So he's one of the few cricketers Unbelievable. That, we're both representing the top Incredible. level in Victoria, football and cricket. He finally thinks, and he's been umming and ahhing about this, do I honour my promise to marry Peg and fly to America? And he really is umming and ahhing it. Yeah, and he hasn't seen her for three and a half years. Mm. So, and he's, he's umming and ahhing, but he decides, I'm going to do it. He flies over there. They hit it off very well again, luckily. All good. And he marries her um, and uh, brings her home. He's suddenly worried about money because this is when cricket didn't pay any money, yeah. really, of note. So he needs a job and the job he's got in... So this is what it's like. He says to the... He's back at the company and uh, he's working uh, uh, for doing filing, remember, for accounts. Yes. And he says to them, can I have two weeks off to go marry this woman in America? And they say, because he's been at the wall for three years, I think you've had enough time off recently and don't give him time off. <laughs> <laughs> that is harsh. <laughs> they were they were harsh back then. Like one the of my wa- favourite stories. Have I told this? It was the Singapore Cricket Club after the war. Yeah. And the Singapore Cricket Club had all their members were from the colonial era, yeah. and a lot of them were Englishmen and, and other servicemen from other countries yeah. from the Commonwealth. Um, when they came back after the war, the Singapore Cricket Club would not allow them in until they'd paid their outstanding bar bills. <laughs> From before the war. It, it's like they've been, it's not like they've been dodging you. Yeah. They've been being shot at. Yeah. And they've come back, oh, hang on. Hang on. Before we allow you to enter, you owe us uh, 50 quid. It's, it's like because everyone had been to war almost. It was like it wasn't a big deal. They just all went, <laughs> nah. So they said to him, no. So he decides, I need to find money. I've got this new wife. Yeah. She's coming to Australia. I'm not. So he finds out that he gets offers a job with a liquor sales company, so booze, okay. alcohol in Sydney, and he moves. This causes a lot of the Victorians. Peggy's family was wealthy, him. though. Were they were wealthy, but she wasn't, and he, he knew he want, there was a manner in which she was accustomed. He believed at the yeah, time okay. he needed to keep her in. You know, it was an f- old-fashioned thing. Now, this he, he starts in this liquor sales job, which means driving around from pub to pub selling booze. Yeah. Now this turned out to be a terrible, <laughs> terrible job. The, the only person I can think of that would be worse at this job is you. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. He works out that going and selling spirits and liqueurs to every bottle shop, that's what he's selling, yeah. 
It's very sociable, and every pub owner and barman in town, yeah. when he shows up, goes, "You're Keith Miller." Yeah. Like he's just break. It's not like he's an old player. He's no, no, just he's... started breaking into the. <laughs> he's just please. It's like a yeah. modern day Australian test team player. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's the equivalent of like if you're in America, it's like Tom Brady walking in when he's starting his so career as quarterback, going, "Would you like to?" You know. So he suddenly is and like... of course, you've got to try before you buy. Yeah. So he's got to sit there and sit down yeah. and try the produce with... With them. Public. They all insist. They say, well, I won't buy unless you, you know. And he's a social guy too. He's he's always been a beer drinker, but suddenly all afternoon he's drinking Contro and Creme de Men. Oh, <laughs> and he's just a write-off. Oh, man. Uh, Peg becomes incredibly unhappy because he's just smashed. He's on he the comes road getting from, hammered. He, yeah, and he comes home from work every day just ripped completely. Even for him, just yeah. even he's going, this is like too much. This isn't fun. <laughs> so um, he's doing this the whole time. After three weeks, it's all too much. And he's not enjoying the hangovers either. And after three weeks, he quits. So he's suddenly in Sydney without a job. Okay. So then he's lucky because being a big sports star, Eric Kennedy is the chief executive of Australian Associated Newspapers Limited. And he says, we're starting a new magazine called Sporting Life. Come be a columnist and journalist for that. Sure. And offers him a lot of money to do it. And he says, yes. That's better. And he loves it. And he actually liked writing. He turns out to, he has ghost writers sometimes, but he's very good at identifying good at stuff. And if you read his book, some of them are ghostwritten, but he is happy to say things. So like in his book, Cricket in Crossfire, he totally goes the tonk on Bradman saying what a terrible person he is sure. at time. Like Not he's, the Lone Ranger, by the way. Yeah, but, he, but he's writing it at the time. Yeah, no, okay, gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah, like he, and he's, publicly. Yeah, and he's not doing one of those biographies you read and go, I learned nothing from that. He's, he's a, like insane. really pulling no punches. So he's a very good sports copywriter. Okay. He learns one day that his editor, who he really likes, keeps getting these coded messages handed and he has to pass them on and he's looking at them and he realises these are coming in on big race days. And Keith being big race thing goes, what are these? And he goes, well, let's just say these are more than reliable tips. (laughs) If you don't tell anyone, I'll cut you in on it. Thank you. So suddenly this is another line of money for him (laughs) because they're getting all the tip-offs. I love this. So he then uh, has to do his first ever, he gets selected for his first ever Ashes tour. Oh, sorry, de- debut, and it's at the Gabba, it's in Australia, 946 to 47. And he'd starred in the Victory Test, so he was, you know, well known to many, but he'd never been seen play in Australia. And Don Bradman, who was captain, had never seen him play since before the yes. war. So he was not then. This becomes, the story is, him and Don Bradman are polar opposites yes. as people, as what they believe in all this. So, for instance... Bradman basically was, and you know this, completely ruthless. Yes. Cricket meant anyth- everything. He was like Michael Jordan well before Michael Jordan. Yeah. It was like you just didn't win. You had to dominate and send a message. Yeah. And you know the Michael Jordan do- documentary he says, I talk that personally all the time. Yeah. Bradman took everything personally yeah. and he would just destroy someone if sure. they had embarrassed him or whatever. Keith is just fought a war, which Bradman <laughs> didn't. And he, you know, and he's like, he's, he's, mate, well, I'm lucky to be alive. Who cares? He's, it's a he, cricket match. A bit more laissez-faire yeah. in his approach. Yeah. And so in the first Ashes test, Miller is bowling to um, Bill Edrich, who's an English batsman. And Miller and Bill Edrich had flown in the RAF in the war, as did Miller. And yeah. they were friends. So here's another guy who's flown the war yeah. with him, risked his life. And, he, and Miller thought, look, you know, he's my old service mate. The last thing he wants after five years' war is to be flattened by a cricket ball. <laughs> so he's not, he's easing up a bit and not bowling really fast yeah. or, bo- or bounces at him, trying to knock his head off. Bradman comes up and says, Don't slow down, Keith, bowl quicker. And he says, This just totally put him off cricket and Bradman. He's like, yeah. Mate, there's bigger things than cricket. Sure. On another occasion during the same series, Miller bowled, um, but Miller would bowl a bouncer sometimes. He, was, he did later in, like a few years later, bounce Edrich quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so he wasn't against it always, but he was uh, like... time wears on. Yeah, he did like another time. Um, another time um, he bowled consecutive bumpers in this Ashes test to Godfrey Evans, who was also a good friend, and then said uh, to him, 
sorry, Godfrey, but I had to do it as the crowd are a bit bored at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a mercurial guy like that. Yeah. Now, he never really uh, got o- along well. He used to complain at another one in this Ashes one that Bradman was not giving him the fielding setup he wanted. So right. he's like, I'm bowling a certain way. You need to move another fielder over there. Yeah. And Bradman's like, no, nah, I'm not doing it because, you know, the captain sets it. And so he's getting more and more annoyed and he gets more and more annoyed. And then at one stage, Bradman throws the ball back to Miller, you know, back to the yes, bowler, as, so, as everyone does. And what, as you know, mainly when the after the, you've bowled the ball, wherever it's ended up, the fielding team gives it back, throws it back to the bowler, a bit like a catcher throwing it back sure. to the bowler in baseball. And you throw it at about waist height, they catch it softly. Yeah. Right? Bradman throws it, it's just a bad throw, and it lands at Miller's feet. That's not on. And Miller looks at him like, I'm like working my butt off here and you're making me bend down with this. Yeah. And anyone else would have just picked it up, right? Miller looks at the ball on the ground, he's in front of the crowd, looks at Bradman, who is the Michael Jordan cricket at the time, and looks at him and looks back down at the ball and then kicks it along the ground back to him. And the whole crowd goes, <gasps> like, what is going on? Like, this is just absolute defiance. Bradman looks down at the ball like, what should I pick this up? Or and So Bradman... Was it probably a right to go, well, you pick it up or whatever. But Bradman decides, well, he p- rip, he bends down, picks it up and then throws it to another fielder to throw back to the <laughs> So it's this whole... Oh, so, that's a quiet trip home in the car. Yeah, that a, is the cricket equivalent. Yeah, so this is like, this is where they're getting to where they're just really not getting along well at all. and they The tension's be, obvious. The tension's there. In 1948, they then go to... England for Ashes Tour. And this is the tour that's known famously as the Invincibles Tour. Yes. This is Don Mad Bradman's greatest team. They go and play 31 matches, tests, county cricket games, everything. And they lo- win every single match. They win 31 matches. It's never been done before yeah. or since. It's known as the Invincibles, this team. Miller loves being back in England. He's, he's on this tour he loves England for so many reasons. He's had the cricket success there. He fought the war there. Yes. He's, He's made well a lot of friends. There. He's loved over there, you know, even He's, more. Like in Australia he is, but, you know, there's... He's loved. Um, he's got all his war buddies there, yeah. so he's, he's mixing with royalty and... He's a couple of mistresses. He's got... That's the other thing, right, is... Um, in England, he's away from Peg and, and eventually they have children. And, you know, he's away from them. Sure. And so he does this thing where he, he goes home to Australia over the rest of his life and has the family time, has the yeah. stability, but then he goes away for six months. He's a sailor on shore life. And he's just basically acts like he's single, yeah. right? And so he loves England. It's just like so. So um, he, he could just do whatever he wanted. No so, iPhones. No, and this was even with if even if someone took photos of you doing something, the media just normally didn't even would print not it. report it. Not report it. So it was. I know you you oh, regret it's that. Just unbelievable! <laughs> it's just, what happened to the world? <laughs> Lost its morals. Uh, so um, once again, him and Bradman keep coming up against each other in just their approach to the game. So in one of the early warm-up games, Australia scores a record 721 runs. <laughs> like, they just brutally destroyed. He's just pounding destroyed him into the ground. And he, no need for that. And people are saying to Bradman, some of the other players are going, come on, come on, let's declare we don't need any more runs. But he's going, no, you don't remember, before the war, England did, there's a famous match where before the war where England just did that to him. Yeah. And he's, like, never forgiven and never forgotten. So he's, like... <laughs> For the rest of his career, it's like there is no mercy for no. the English ever. Yeah. Lesson learnt. So Miller comes out to bat. The score's two for 364. <laughs> it's a warm-up game too. It's not even, you know. And um, he allows himself to be bold first ball and turns back around to their wicketkeeper and goes, thank God that's over, and just walks off. So he's just like, I'm not playing I don't need this to be. thing. Yeah. You can do it, but I'm not. Um, Miller also have to, had to bowl through pain because... Depending on what you read, either that wrestling match he had or crashing the plane, he had a sore back. Sore back. He often, as he walked back to bowl, had to press a disc of his back back into place. That's Jeez, how bad it was. So it was real pain. They and didn't so rotate the bowlers then either, didn't they? No, you, you were, were just two, uh, you were, And he was an all-rounder. He was expected yeah. to bat too, you know. Yeah. So, so he said to 
um, Bradman asked him the night before the test at Lords. He said, "Are you right to bowl?" And he says, "I don't think I am right to bowl tomorrow. I'll bat, but I don't think I'm up to. I'll field and bat, but I don't think I can bowl." Yeah. And so Bradman goes, "Okay." Um, and then so Ray Lindwall bowls the first over, mm. and Miller's in slips. And at the end of the over, Bradman tosses the ball to Miller and says, "Have a bowl." What? And Miller is like. Now, I, re- he, I reckon he thinks because this is in front of the crowd, I'm going to have to I'm, do it. I'm going to have to do it. So he's going to, and he doesn't, and there's always this sense that Bradman thinks Miller's playing up his back problems, where Miller sees it as, I fought in a war and crashed several times. You don't get Why didn't Bradman, by the way? Fight. Is there a reason why Bradman didn't fight in the war? He had uh, some. He was a lot older. Like he's four, Bradman's yeah, forty okay. for this tour, and which second, in those days was old. <laughs> yeah, it was not, very. Yeah, not that's right. 40. That's like eighty, you know. <laughs> there. And also, he um, he had a, a um, problems. He had a, a disease that gave him a lot of aches and pains and stuff. That was all a legit sure. thing. But okay. there was always this divide between who'd actually fought in the I, war I and bet there was. who hadn't. And Tough. Miller was someone who could say, "Well, yeah. I'd really yeah. done my bit." Um, now, in front of the crowd, Miller just throws the ball back and says, I'm not bowling. Yeah. And the whole crowd's watching this again. So it's a bit like the kicking the ball back yeah. and forth. This is happening very publicly. The media are riding it up the next day. So this Miller-Bradman thing is it's in the press. It's a dick move for Bradman. Well, that's, that's what I uh, think. So after the game, Bradman came into the dressing room and went at them all. He says, I'm 40 and I can do my full day's work in the field. And just after the game? After, or the, the, ga- after yeah. the game. Yeah. Or after that day's play, yeah. sorry. And Miller snaps in reply, so would I if I had uh, fibroitis, which is the disease, the nerve and muscle pain yeah. disease that Bradman does have. Yeah. But Miller's basically saying, yeah, if I had yours, I'd be fine. It's got, I've got something much worse. So yeah. they're fighting in the dressing room. Um, the thing too, and in some ways Bradman's also right, because Miller would play better if he wasn't hungover, which he often was. Yes. He was often late. Yeah, he often he seemed to just get disinterested in the game and throw his wicket away. So Bradman felt attention. inclined to. So push Bradman him was on right sometimes, yeah. and, okay. and, right. and 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 so it's not all Bradman's evil. Bradman did like Miller. He just thought he didn't take cricket seriously yeah. enough. They had it more complex than it seemed at times. Okay. Sid Barnes, a teammate of Miller's, said if Miller had the same outlook, this ruthless thing as Bradman or Ponsford. He would have made colossal scores and he would have been the statistician's greatest customers. Right. customer. There are so many people that basically say if Miller had taken cricket seriously as like yeah. anyone else, he would have been one of the, he would the have been almost, possibly the all time great. Like yeah. that's how good he was. But he always just didn't. One story had Don Bradman, who's captain obviously, answering a knock on the door late one night in his hotel and he sees Miller standing there in a dinner suit. <laughs> and it's like 11.30 at night, you know. <laughs> and, he, and Miller says, to Bradman, um, you said I had to be in bed at curfew. I was. Now I'm going out. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, win the toss tomorrow. Bat. Yeah. Uh, another one was at the end of the Lord's Test, Miller had attended a concert and a party and he returned to the hotel at dawn the next morning just before breakfast, right? Bradman notices this and addresses him as Keith rather than his nickname Nugget. No, he's called the golden boy of Australian cricket by journalists, so yeah. they call him Nugget. And it shows that he's not very happy. Australia are due to play Surrey at the Oval on the same day and Keith Miller's got home at dawn with no right. sleep. So Bad- Bradman wins the toss, decides to field. <laughs> of course he does. And instead of putting Miller in the slips, oh, no. in, where you don't have to do much walking, yeah. he puts them on the out on fine leg boundary so that between each Evil. wicket he has to walk almost halfway around the Oval That's each right. time. Yeah. Right, so this is happening as punishment. Right, you're going to have to be in the worst place to Left field. Left hand, right hand bat. Yeah, you have change to move of over, every over, oval. Oh, yeah. So you're instead of just standing at slips, barely moving, you're going to be doing yeah. a lot of K's out in the field. Between overs, um, a spectator leans over, and they can all see that Miller is struggling. And he says, "This spectator says, I can lend you my bike." <laughs> right. <laughs> And Miller says, that's a good idea. So a few minutes later, the bike's passed over the fence <laughs> at the end of the over and Miller cycles to the opposite fine leg <laughs> position and the crowd's laughing as are all the cricketers and even Bradman, in, to his laugh. credit, has to laugh and soon after he brings him closer into the wicket says, like, your punishment's done. Um, 
So while he's in England, this is partly why he loves England. This just shows you how in Miller is. Even because he he's way more social than Bradman and sure. everything too. Um, Lord Tedder, who was the deputy to General Eisenhower in World War Two, so the second in command of all the forces in D Day, and the, he was in charge of all air service personnel and operations for Europe. Yeah, so pretty big guy, and has been made a lord and all this. Um, he joins uh, them at Buckingham Palace for tea, and he sees Miller, who he loves, and has befriended him back in the war. And he pretends to be a waiter and comes up with a full tray in his hand. And he approaches Miller and says, excuse me, sir, and uh, your tea, sir. And Miller, in an exaggerated English <laughs> aristocrat voice, says, thank you, boy. Here you are, lad, and hands him a penny. <laughs> and the whole, his teammates all go, that's Lord Tanner. That's like, this yeah. guy's like second to Eisenhower in the war. Sure. And you're treating him, <laughs> you know, you guys are playing this game. And Tedder says, thank you very much, sir, and does a deferential tug of his cap as he backs away. Another time Miller... Fantastic. Yeah, it's just like, another, and this is where Miller's fun. It's like yeah. Even like, you know... Another time, Miller and a few teammates, together with some uh, Australian uh, newspaper guys, they're invited by Prince Philip, who at this point is married to a Princess Elizabeth, yes. who's going to become Queen Elizabeth II. Prince Philip uh, says to them all, why don't you all come back to my hotel room for a drink? It's early afternoon. It's like one o'clock in the afternoon, right? It's a very hot afternoon. They've got a day off. And Prince Philip and Miller get along. They bump into each other all the time during the next the rest of their lives yeah. right they get along well they like a drink miller's always got broken like a broken nose or a black eye because he's always getting in fights sure. or um jealous husbands are hitting him yeah and prince philip <laughs> he always seems to bump into prince philip when that's happened he's so prince philip, yeah, yeah prince philip's always like teasing him about it prince philip um says come in have a drink and they all walk in there and the duke's guests they look and the door to the adjoining suite is open right and they're all waiting there. And uh, the Prince Philip says to one of the newspaper men, would you mind going to the loo and just flushing it until I tell you to stop? And the pressman's like, okay, because it's like Prince Philip. Yes. He's like, uh, okay. So he goes and does it. They're all like going, this is weird. And then on his return, this newspaper man, Prince Philip goes, you can stop. You can stop now. And he stops. And he, the guy comes back in and he realises that the um, Prince Philip has opened two bottles of French champagne and he says to the pressman, Her Majesty, meaning Princess Elizabeth, is is in the next room and she's not too keen about me drinking so early in the afternoon and these corks can be awfully noisy. Fantastic. <laughs> this is great. So this is the fun Miller's having, right? Yeah. Miller's loving life. He's like, you know, he's attractive. So young. He should. Yeah, and after the war, it's like all... Um, after this tour, Bradman, to his credit, is full of praise for Miller. Uh, he, he says he's the best slip fielder in the world. He's a great bowler. He's, he did say, though, altogether a crowd-pleasing personality whose limitations are caused mainly by his own failure to concentrate. So that's Bradman's take on his tour. <laughs> so it's like a report card, a serious report card. Yeah. When Miller is getting on the ship to come home to Australia, this is all pre-flights yeah. mainly, he's asked what... What are the three most beautiful things about England? And Miller said, the hills of Derbyshire, the legs sweep of Dennis Compton and Princess Margaret. <laughs> wow. In no particular order. Yeah, that's like, you know. He gets back to Australia. This is in 48, 49. And Sorry, there's no question. Oh, even well, even there's more to come Margaret. of this. There's more to come. come so, um, 948, 49, back in Australia, that summer is most remarkable because Don Bradman retires for good this time. He'd retired before and yeah. come back, but this time he's 40. He has a testimonial match in Melbourne. Um, Don holds Keith back in the batting order. So when the crowd's full, he then wants Keith to come out and be, because he knows Keith is entertaining. It's a testimonial. Keith comes out and just doesn't care and just tries to hit sixes off every ball and goes out almost straight away. Right. And Bradman, Miller says, when I was out, I saw Bradman looking at me with disgust written all over his face and clearly he thought I'd not concentrate and did not care. My feeling about this was that Bad Bradman, like so many others, took the game too seriously. Cricket was meant to be enjoyed at all levels and I certainly enjoyed it as such. Yep. They then play another testimonial for two other players um, and Bradman and Miller on opposite sides. This is in the same summer. 
And everyone's excited because it's Bradman versus Miller, Bradman batting and Miller bowling. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, this is going to be good. Miller knows Bradman's expecting him to bowl a bouncer at his head in the first yes. bowl. So he does. And um, Bradman strokes it right to the boundary, yeah. right? And Bradman's sort of like grateful to Keith to like, yeah. oh, Thank you're, you. you're, seeing, you're showing that I can still do this kind yeah. of thing, you know? Um, Keith decides to bowl another one faster and harder at his head. <laughs> This is a testimonial match. It's not a real... Yeah. Bradman is, you know, and, and um, he says, I bowled this second bouncer for the amusement of the crowd because um, it's an entertaining testimonial. Sure. That's why I did it. This time, though, Bradman doesn't laugh. Bradman just stares. He's, this is in, in his book, Miller says, he looked daggers at me. For, so for sheer de devilment, I decided to give him the third <laughs> bumper. So he bowls at his heads again. Um, Bradman sees he's about to do this at the last second, gets in a position to hook, but doesn't and goes out, hits oh. the ball in the air and gets caught. So Bradman Crikey. is, this might be his last kind of game, you know, even though it's a test he's, he's just given him a send off. He's had three bounces and gone out on the third one. The next week or so, it's announced the tour, a week later, it's announced a tour of South Africa. Bradman is no longer captain, but is a selector. Yeah. It's announced Miller has not been selected. Wow. Miller thinks very much it's to do with... The bouncers. The bouncers. <laughs> there's three men on the thing. They all swear they voted for him. He goes, someone's lying. Yeah. Because there's only three of you. So it's not possible that you all voted yes. yes. And I'm not on. So, uh, the media are furious he's not going to South. Because yeah. it's just... It's so obvious he should be playing. Correct. And South Africans are furious. Because yeah, he's he the biggest... on seats. This is the biggest draw card. I mean, this he's now getting into in Brandon. the media and everything because of like the rumours of the affair with Princess Margaret have been in the paper yeah. and all this. He is like a combination of a Hollywood star. He's known as the Casanova of the crease is how they describe him, <laughs> right? So he's like, you know, movie star cloth with... I thought that was Boonie. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's our, that's our, that's our Casanova of the crease. Uh, finally, he um, does get told one of the players gets injured over in South Africa he gets called up but it's so, not like you can pop him on a plane you well they, put him on a boat he's, he almost misses the trip after arriving late at the dock in Perth after a drunken night out <laughs> the next boat was not leaving for several weeks <laughs> so he just made it so anyway he starts playing and now he's entrenched in the team he's playing he's going at um, Ashes in Australia does a West Indies tour goes to Pakistan he becomes captain of New South Wales mm. so this is where they see him as having some leadership here. And they also know he's bums on seats. And this is, you got to remember, in Australia at the time, Sheffield Shield meant something because you'd have whole summers where there wouldn't be an international tour. Yeah. So it was only Sheffield Shield sure. for the whole summer. And people went and loved I miss those it. days. Yeah, so he was really in. Um, one time he was asked as New South Wales, cop uh, um, New South Wales captain, a reporter said he'd taken seven wickets for 12 runs, which is amazing if you're not a cricket fan. And they said, oh, can you sum up you know, how you did it? Mm. He said, well, there's three reasons. First, I bowl, bowl bloody well. Second, uh, second, oh, well, you can forget the other two reasons. <laughs> Another time as captain, he's giving a speech at a, a mayor is holding a farewell. They've been in a New South Wales team in a country town. Yeah. It's the mid fifties, and he's called upon his captain to go out and say some words at this function. Yeah, and uh, so they're all talking, and so Keith steps up to the microphone and he says, "My lord, uh, your worship, lord, uh, ladies and gentlemen of, uh, of this uh, magnificent town of uh, 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 never anywhere have I or my players received so marvellous and hospitable a welcome as here in this famous New Wales, this New South Wales town of." Um, uh, uh, anyway, you cannot imagine just what a delight and honour it has been for us to be here in this splendid town, uh, uh, city. Uh, I've played uh, cricket in many parts of the world, and you may not know this, but I've never received such kindness as during the past few hours in this superb city of... Uh, uh, at this stage, Keith turns around and says to Richie Benno, um, for Christ's sakes, Richie, what's the effing name of this effing town? <laughs> The next, the next, the next day, he turns up late to a coaching clinic for t the kids. And instead of teaching, he made a speech and he advised the children to play tennis as there was more money on offer. 
So 1956, it's his third and final tour of England. Uh, Miller's 37. His back's pretty stuffed at this point. He makes friends with a tall, pretty young woman, uh, as described in the newspaper, a 19-year-old Pat Williams who's a receptionist. And he chats to her a lot. Who knows what else? And he says, "When you, uh, if you ever want, come to Australia and I'll look after you and be your legal guardian till you turn 21 because she's 18. Oh, what an offer. And he says, you could live with us. And she's like, oh, I might take you off on that offer. Miller then also goes to the Royal Ascot races during the tour and he's photographed with one of his girlfriends. He's yes. got many girlfriends. Who's a former Miss Victoria, uh, <laughs> Beverly Prowse, who he's begun seeing quite a lot on this tour. Okay. And the shot is outside the Kensington Palace Hotel and they'd spent the night there the night before and this picture makes all the Australian newspapers. Okay. Right? Not good. Um, it just shows them standing there. The, I'll put oh, the photo no. on the Discord for the There's members. But it's, it's, it's Yeah, so, <coughs> so he takes her to the races. And at the races, a friend from his flying days, Max Aitken, who's the son of the newspaper proprietor, Lord Beaverbrook, who owned the uh, London Express, he meets Miller for champagne. He takes him aside and he says, look, you're getting close to the end, aren't you, Keith? Keith's like, yeah, and he goes... I tell you what, we'll give you £10,000 to write a book, which is a lot at the wow. time, um, and we'll put that out. And then we also want you to offer you £7,500 to cover the Australian Ashes in Australia for us and a bunch of other tours totalling up to £25,000. Miller is at the races where he loves. He's with Miss Victoria. He's drinking and he's just been offered <laughs> enough money to secure his... Like, it make him yeah. well off into his retirement. So he's feeling really, really good. Um, and he rings Peg that night and says, I got this job off, it's going to make us secure for the rest of our lives. It's great. And then she mentions she's seen the photo in the paper. Yeah. And Miller, sa she says, I've already seen the photo, dear. And uh, Miller says, she was only some Australian model. And Peg says, yes, dear. And if that's your story, you stick to it, dear. So Peg knows. Yeah. And they have this kind of weird unwritten rule. Don't, don't ask, don't tell. Don't ask, don't tell. And what you do is in, in England is fine. But when you're back here. Here uh, on the straight and narrow. And it's almost, and it's, Peg's like. It's a, a very sophisticated, I don't think civilized. Peg's happy. I think she loves Miller. Yeah, yeah, you're all, <laughs> you're like, why isn't everyone doing this? Look at that in writing. <laughs> but, but Peg's like, realises divorce this time's messy. You don't do it. It's you know. It's yeah. going to you know. She, so uh, who's going to provide all that? It's it's a time where women and and men can't get divorced easily. Yeah. She's decided it's better to be in the tent and just ignore this, raise the four boys, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um. So another time that the next day Miller has partied all night with Prowls, yes. and a mate of his Ted Rippon who played for for Essendon, uh, in the football. He arrives at the hotel room, he knocks on the door because he's getting some tickets and he hears a voice yell out, come in, Ted, the tickets are on the table. And he walks in and you can see the door of the bathroom's open and Miller's in the shower with prowls. And he goes, this is just what Miller's like, yeah. right? Um, Miller's also in touch with Princess Margaret and he gets invited over there and it's all reported in the media. He's gone to lunch with Princess Margaret. and So now it's coming to the point where he can't get away with this stuff Right. Like he once could. The yes. media is starting to take starting pictures to and circulate it and all this. And uh, so he's kind of doing all this. The la This last tour of um, England's a disaster for him. He, he bats terribly, doesn't play well. Okay. He's, he's done. So he announces he's going to retire. Peg inherits £60,000 for her father and buys this uh, new uh, property. And so basically she is also in this position now where she's financially set up. Yeah. So Miller then, and it's like retirement sends him a bit odd, Miller brings Prowse back to Australia and sets her up just a few kilometres down the road from where he and Peg live. You idiot. So he's never done this before. It's yeah. always been at arms. Rules of the yeah, rules. Yeah, at arms. And Peg is furious because she's like, this is, everyone knows, yeah. they see you around town. It's not in London. It's not in the, your, you know. Yeah. Um, he says, well, I, I'm, I need some time for my own self. So they basically have a trial separation. And a week or so in this arrangement, Peg takes the boys around to see their dad at 
where he's staying with prowls and miller opens the door looks at them and goes never come around without warning me and shuts the door and the boys are significantly that's disappointing well it's a lot of his boys have a few of them have heroin addictions okay. which is all very public in the future they have a rough life he was not he's a neglected, his he's a neglected father he's very much obvious it's the typical thing war never talks about that yeah lives his own distant life distant father grown apart over time yeah just you know um so it's a it's a it's an odd time uh when they're there even worse in the middle of while this is happening the 18 year old secretary pat williams shows up on the on the boat and says i'm here to come live with you (laughs) and peg peg has to come and meet her with with keith and she just knows exactly what's going on and this is like one of those keith was probably drunk when he said yeah come out i can't remember yeah but she shows up peg the media show up and find out about it and peg has to be interviewed and peg and this is where I'm very impressed by Peg. They say, oh, how long is Patricia staying with you guys? And they're all sort of... Waiting for her Wink, to wink, wink. Yeah, let you try and get her to blow up. And she says, oh, as long as she wants. We're, we're crowded, but there's always room for more. No problem at all. She just plays it so smart, right? She's very impressive. So Miller spends the rest of his... Fun's gone out of it a bit. It was a bit, bit of fun when he was... The, you know, yeah, it's like... Bar flying around Europe. And yeah, it's he not he as... He brought his stuff home with him and it's... Yeah. Now, Miller, though, it uh, seems... I think Miller would have been one of those guys that... He seems... He's almost two different people. He's one person in Australia, which is a neglectful father in many yeah, ways. Yeah. And his kids have said this. They've been estranged for him yeah. over the years and stuff. Um, and not a great husband and all that. And then he goes to England and he turns into, like... If he'd never got married, he probably would have been a happy... Yeah, very happy. So, for example, when he's back in England, he's retired now, but he goes back every year. So, one time he's over there, he had a good win at the races, and he goes to Northampton's county ground with some friends to watch cricket. He notices that this guy worked as a gateman who'd been there his whole career, was no longer there. He says, well, where is he? And they said, oh, well, you know, he's now um, too frail to stand up all day. He doesn't do that job anymore, he's, but here's his address. So, Miller shows up. These guys are in their 70s. And he's, they're delighted. Keith Miller's just shown up. And Keith remembers him yeah. and says, oh, I missed you. And he's in their house and he sees a 1930s wooden radio out there, but there's no television. And he says, oh, you don't care for TV? And they said, oh, we love TV. Our neighbours got one, but we couldn't possibly afford it. And Keith said, oh, okay. Next morning, a door knocks yeah. and there's a TV set. Right. So Miller's doing all this thing. Another time, there's a friend of his, Betty, who'd worked with him in the war at their Air Force base. Mm. She'd come into a sizable inheritance, so she was quite rich. He shows up to see her, and this unkempt man opens the door, and he says, who are you? Uh, who are you, the man says to Miller. He says, I'm an old friend of Betty. Where is she? And uh, he says, he, he's suspicious but lets him in. And he says, oh, hi, Betty, I want to take you out to lunch. So Keith and her go to lunch. And he says, who's that bloke in the house? And Betty's, like, a bit fearful. But he says, whatever happens, I'll help you. And she says, I hired him as a gardener, but he's moved in and now he's taking over. He's made me a prisoner in my home. He tells everyone that I'm crazy, so no one wants anything to do with me. He says, I've gone nuts to everyone. They all believe him. Miller takes her home, says, don't say anything, goes to the policeman, says, this is happening. And the policeman said, oh, her, she's a nutter. And Keith says, who told you that? And she goes, everyone knows. And he goes, yeah, but who told you? And she goes, oh, well, the gardener. And he says, well, I've known her since the war. She hasn't changed. She's not crazy. This guy's a problem. You need to do something. And they said, no. So Miller says, okay. Goes out and calls the head of Scotland Yard, who's a friend. <laughs> the gardener's investigated. It's discovered there's a warrant out for his arrest and he's done it to multiple women and he's arrested and jailed. Fantastic. So he's this well complete done. other guy. Another yeah. time, in April 1995, he's with his old mate Gus Glendening in Melbourne's come to visit him at the Flemington Races. And they're drinking at the pub of uh, VFL footballer Brian Roberts. Whale Roberts? Well, yep. Still well known. known. He says, Miller says to Roberts, next time you're in London, come see me and we'll hang out. Yeah. So they come over and they're at Lord's and Robert says, I'm at Lord's. Um, he says, oh, well, let me know when you're there. He gets there. And he's wearing shorts and thongs, which is not a dress code no. for the MCC members, right? No. But Miller goes up the doorman, Frank, who works at the entry of the MCC members area, and goes, Frank, this is Whale. 
I want to show him the long room. If you don't let him in, I'll throw you over the balcony. <laughs> and they say, that's fine, Keith. So Roberts is shown through the long room in shorts and thongs. Fantastic. And no member dares address, uh, like, you know, yeah. uh, care. Um, Miller also learns of Ernie Toshak, who's a former Invincibles teammate in a Sydney hospital. And Miller visits him and you know, he understands he's not good. Not yep. pro- in it. So he brings in a bottle of whiskey, smuggles it in, waits for the nurse to leave. And then they sit up all night drinking the bottle of whiskey. Miller goes to leaves and falls over and knocks himself unconscious in the hospital room. <laughs> so at the end, Miller is getting old and he has cancer, skin cancer. He's broken his hip. He's in a wheelchair a lot. And he's had multiple strokes. Okay. The family will say of this time that he's not himself. And this might even have gone back and explained some of his behaviour over some yeah. of the years. Because he decides um, at this point, Peg's 82, you know, so they're both in their 80s. He decides to get a divorce and marry a 56-year-old woman called Marie Calman, um, which shocks Peg. And the boys basically break off their relationships with him. Yeah. So this is the quandary of Miller. Yeah. He's both yeah. larger than life fun, but there's this, you know, cost for there's it this, all that yeah, comes a with weak it. Spot. Even though this is all happening, Miller never sort of is he says they said, you know, what do you think about death? He was asked not long before he died. He said, Never think about it, no regrets. I've had a hell of a good life, been damn lucky. Peg passes away in November two thousand three. He misses the funeral because he's too. He can't travel by plane anymore. He's just oh. not. It's more. He's not. Apparently, he is devastated by this. Yep. He dies at the age of eighty-four on the eleventh October two thousand and four. He was only at the time of his death one of three Australians to be honoured with a portrait in the famed long rooms at Lords. The others were Sir Don Bradman, Victor Trumper, and since then Shane Warne has been added. So yep. there's now four. He gets a state funeral. His he was asked uh, John Bradman, the son of Don, Sir Donald was asked to speak at the funeral by Keith. And he actually says that, look, Bradman and Miller didn't get along in many ways, but Miller and Bradman also got along in other ways. He said, we were often babysat by Miller and Dad and him actually got along very well off the field. It was yeah. more an on-the-field thing. Um, the Miller boys, uh, Bill, Peter, Dennis and Bob, had all reconciled their father just before his death and they carried the coffin. Ian Chappell got up and spoke... And actually paid tribute to Peggy Miller because he felt she was being written out a bit of the story. Yes. Miller wrote in 1956, long before his death, I have numerous failings, but then I've never set myself up as a shining example of proprietary. Yet whatever my faults, I have no time for the half-truth. I like to call a spade a spade. And that is Dennis Miller. Who, who? Uh, that is Keith Miller. That is just a, <laughs> And that is Keith Miller. Here, here. Well done. What an epic yarn. It's a crazy tale. It is uh, unbelievable. I'm just And I don't want to excuse him, but it's that generation that went to the war. Yeah. There is I've met a lot of them in like over the years. They didn't come back and ha- adjust. And I don't know if Keith uh, ever would have. They didn't come back and, and live an ordinary suburban it was almost like they normal could, life. Yeah, yeah, and there's almost like this thing with Keith where he can't go back into it. Like it's his, I mean, I'm yes. not trying to excuse everything he did either, but there was no mental health care no, that's right. or anything. Yeah. There was no, you know... And the family seemed to think a lot of like his later behaviour was like stroke-related. Yeah. But I think also he was just... a you know, he was this weird character that just, I, I, I think... It's like, a great story. It's in the modern day, he would have just probably got divorced, wouldn't he? And lived as a... And, he, and, he wouldn't and, women, have done. and women wouldn't have uh, ex- probably accepted that as the, as a, a binding right. relationship either. That's you know right. what I mean? Things have changed. I mean, that they're probably happier than most for most of the time. Um, yeah. I don't know, but it's a wild ride. But it's, it's worth ripper. exploring that and six months on, six months off. I'll go put it to... <laughs> I'll get something drawn up. But the chances of this passing are slim. Now, well, we should say before we go, this was our last for the year. We've had a fun year this year. But you have plans. What are they? Well, we've got, bon- we've got bonus episodes coming from members. So, yes. you know, you can if you want a bit more content for a few more weeks, we've got bonus episodes still come out. We're back early in the new year. We've got a lot planned for next year, don't we? Sure. So, um, 
But we've had a ball. Keep your eye on it because uh, you've got some specials coming up. Yeah, and, 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 uh, and yeah, we'll have some specials over uh, summer. But uh, we can't thank everyone enough for listening. Yes. We have had a ball this year. It's been great fun. Uh, thanks for your support. And uh, we've, it's encouraged us enough to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs>